called The Perfect Man. we have that are a mere miles away. Charles Fort is one of them. Charles Fort's poems have appeared in the Best American Poetry 2000-2003. Carnegie Mellon Press reprinted his book, The Town Clock Burning, under its classic contemporary series. His work has appeared in Callaloo, The Georgia Review, Connecticut Writers Anthology, Road Apple Review, White Laid, and Argo. A McDowell Fellow, Charles attended the Breadloaf Writers Conference and Cranbrook Writers Conference. He is also a recipient of the Randall Gerald Poetry Prize and the Mary K K Carolyn Davis Memorial Award. Charles holds an MFA from Bowling Green State University and was the distinguished Paul W. Reynolds and Clarence Kingston Reynolds Endowed Chair in Poetry from, 2000, or from 1997 to 2007, a decade, at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. And without further ado, Charles, we're excited to have you read. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Not that I need it. 
Um, thank you so much for coming on this uh, Mojave day. <laughs> My um, mom, who will be 90 years old, uh, the heat was too much. She, she had planned to come, but she's, she's not here. But my nephew, bodyguard, TC is back there. My sister, Karen, is here. My sister, Marie, is here. <laughs> um, I want to especially, uh, and I'll talk about, a bit about her. I have two daughters. I raised alone the last 14 years of my life. I'm a widower. Shelly Fort is here. Um, both of my daughters are screen equity actresses. Shelly graduated from Brown last spring. My older daughter was in rehearsal now in New York City, University of Washington, Seattle. School, I think it's bigger than Connecticut. Um, more importantly, I had major surgery last June. This is my first reading. It was supposed to last two hours and went on for 12. Come August, while I was rehabilitating, um, my friends would come and get me for groceries and Walgreens and so forth. My daughters hadn't heard from me for four or five days. Shelley called 911 from New York City to New Britain. They were angels, they brought me back. I actually saw a light behind them in the healing. But that's uh, briefly, and Shelley, a few weeks ago, was in the New York Times photograph and review of her play. She will appear in um, the mountaintop next month outside Linux Max, uh, Mass in the Berkshires, the mountaintop. Uh, it's just a two person play Martin Luther King and Shelley, who visits King the night before his death. She's actually, she cleans his room, but she's the angel of death. I'm going to read. Um, you know, I'm a Connecticut Yankee, born and raised in New York, uh, New Britain, Connecticut. And this poem appeared in the Connecticut Writers Anthology, which is strange to mention late 70, 1979. Um, it's a, um, what I, I was dealing with forms back then as well, variant sonnet, if you will, it deals with love, disintegration, and after effects of love. It's also based on, in part on, I was studying Gerard Manley Hopkins at the time, his in stress, in scape, sprung rhythm. It's called Two Spring. To spring, in spring, there is one road where nothing stops moving. And the silver rings inside ashen trees rotate with each sunset. This is the road you will find me on. I will kiss the wind slowly until at the end of this road it sings. This is the voice you will hear from me. You will know by the steady reach of my arms, I am the vaulted shadow in wait. This is the town you will find me in. Under the shelter of your eyes in spring, I will fall into your arms like ash. And if you can hold on to, in terms of choreography, <laughs> my late wife was a modern dancer choreographer, wait for applause if you're gonna give me any at the end. <laughs> Please, yeah, thank you. The title, um, my first book came out in 1985, small press, even though it did end up in the New York Times, like father, like daughter, <laughs> being reviewed and so forth. But um, 
it took me seven months to find the title for this, my book in this title poem, The Town Clock Burning. New England, every small town is a clock, and even around the world, but all is not well. The town clock burning. The clock positions each of us in one square block behind the church. Nothing is counted more, and year after year, we march as it tells us to march. This half-stepping clock falters. Its pendulum craves motion and time. As powder and flame shadow each face, we guard what it tells us to guard. Does this half-stepping helmsman know how a holy war begins? What bell-shaped terror, what moan, what hour we stop when it tells us to stop? This is the clock of boundaries marking its final descent as its final seconds pass into history and without pause we harm what it tells us to harm. You know, poet, the poet as observer, we are witness to the absurdity, terror in the world. In this poem, uh, I have references to Dante's Inferno, two lovers banished in hell, together unable to touch. And I also quote Tennyson's In Memoriam. On stepping stones we may rise. It's called Race War. We are carnal sinners blown about forever like Hell Proper's Palo and Francesca. We are face to face, we are reaching out, but we are not alive anymore. Nothing like love here tonight, between races that moan, rocks that rise, and the kindness that wounds and aches and whimpers. This is a moment in history that refuses to sit still, and our hands become great serpents in a battle without victory. In this great experiment, we exchange blows on our shapeless faces until our eyes meet like playmates in a meadow. We are children of circumstance, slave ships, and reckless stars, and there are few hours left in this world that we may rise on stepping stones, taking our dead selves to higher things. We lead each other away from each other, odd and sightless creatures. This moment is against us. Ripe and cunning, earth is not sufficient, and earth is our only companion. My first daughter was born. I wrote a poem about her. A few years later, my first next book comes out, and Shelley goes, where's my poem? <laughs> and Shelton Claire was on my book cover, even. You know. So in my, one, my other book, I put, I put them both together. <laughs> <clears throat> Prose poem for Claire Fort. Winter brings my wife a child, and your birth arrives with the morning tide like wings alive in a jar. The sunflower seeds and thorns bloom in your hands, Claire, and we walk in the mist and draw circles in the sand. I read your palms like a map, and there are small islands and mountain roads rising in your summer eyes. Is my daughter the dancer, actress, artist, gifted in language or song? I search the form in proper length to write one impossible verse to place into your hand. The unspoken metaphor speaks like a meteor into the simple throne of time I've built for you. And your birth arrives with the morning tide like wings alive in the jar. I actually didn't write a single poem for Shelley next. I wrote a poem for both of them. <laughs> and this is a variant villa now for two daughters. There is no history in their eyes as they tap the lilac, drum, and birch roll out the silver necklace into a straight line over the stone and open wound. 
The light brown yet darker daughter sits on the father's back porch and reads a poem through the brown yet whiter one under his arms. There is no history in their eyes, only the ancestral trick light pulling the cart out of the mud and war with mules, peasants, and slaves. There are 10,000 words of father's fortune in their eyes. A hollow star, a broken wheel, caboose, wild horse, wings over a blue pond. Their father's pen replaces the hollow star with a broken wheel and drops a whistle on the train as the wild horses graze and stare at the wings above the blue pond. There is no history in their eyes. Only two daughters in the backyard, hidden under the cellar door. This is their evening of metaphor. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> My third appearance in the Best American Poetry this year, this poem, first time I've read it, Edward Hirsch was the editor selected. And it, um, and it came, I walked into a cafe to write. And I noticed the mother and what I assume were her daughter you know, ordering coffee. But I, something was awry, something was not right. And um, they sat down. I think the, the daughter was weeping while she was ordering coffee. And they sat down and the mother was uh, drinking coffee and the daughter started crying profusely. And I, you know, I think it was Alzheimer's and this poem was inspired if that's such a word by that, what I had observed. These are, next ones are villanelles. I'm writing 200 of the damn things. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting close. I started five years ago, or seven. I lost count. One had lived in a room and loved nothing. One had lived in a room and loved nothing full of spiders and what memory remained. One had loved and she had forgotten things. Clock stopped, an aeroplane lost in the dark. And who was that voice on the telephone? One had lived in a room and loved nothing. It was a rare sleep in Helter Skelter. One awakened a half-blessed and charmed fool. One had loved and she had forgotten things. One had lived in a room and loved nothing, left alone in her wedding gown and throne. Who gave her a mantis kiss as jazz played? The faceless lover and last known address, a writing pad and table overturned. One had loved and she had forgotten things. What was day or night with no hours left? And who were the two in the photograph? One had loved and she had forgotten things. One had lived in a room and loved nothing. This is uh, one of my favorite movies as a kid in New Britain, the Strand Theater was um, Sound of Music. You know, I have a photograph of the marquee that I took you know, a thousand years ago. And I love that, and then I heard John Coltrane's version, and I love that too, to this day. So this is a period in Georgia Review, it's uh, for John Coltrane. It's called, These Were a Few of My Favorite Things. These were a few of my favorite things. Summer fan, trap door, spider, screech owl. Notes heard in heaven were notes pinned in hell. What spell curse rained down from the beggar's bell? A tainted absinthe spoon in a bedpan? Few things were left saving after the flood. The undiscovered planet's unearthly sounds, a woman making love in Satan's arms. Notes pinned in hell were notes heard in heaven. His tenor saxophone lost in fire, a gas stove exploded, and the high winds left the ship's masthead in the moon's wreckage. It was in perfect pitch and love's demise, a bass line rising in the smoke and woe. Notes heard in heaven were notes pinned in hell. He played heroin like a minotaur, like a praying mantis with human legs. His music in a pile of ruined things, notes pinned in hell, were notes heard in heaven.
uh, one of my one of my books. <laughs> See me after class. <laughs> one of my obsessions, and one of my books is called Frankenstein Was a Negro, and I discovered this through uh, what professors do. I taught almost forty years as a professor, but um, that's another story. I titled the second book of my trilogy, Frankenstein Was a Negro, before I found out that Mary Shelley had given her monster Negroid Haitian features. The black man being torn apart and put together in the image of a monster, not a man, for eternity. She created Frankenstein, a Negro. She created Frankenstein, a Negro, known in literature as the Scarecrow, with a frayed noose lynched to his bolted neck. He became the scaremonger in their eyes, the sink filled with vital human organs, part human and Negro, master and slave. His body was shipped to his master's lab. The lightning strike has singed his weakened pulse, swollen feet and head placed on a body taken from the town drunk under a bridge. One arm cut into tendon and bristle on a broken man lowered into lie, opera of flesh, eyelet of desire, fishing line, razor, knife, and gilded spleen, scalpel and heaving chest without a heart. They created the image of a god made godless by flesh and belief in man. What they thought was a monster was a man who wept for the Negro. Hello? Hello. I just finished my novel this summer, um, so it's, I lost track of track of pages, like over four hundred damn pages. What poet writes that many? <laughs> and um, it's called the Last Black Hippie in Connecticut novel. So I'll, I'm taking orders afterwards. Right? You can roll them up and smoke the money. You know, uh, <laughs> I bought four tickets to Woodstock. I'm glad my mom's not here. Um, and I never made it to Woodstock. I sold them for five dollars. I should have kept the damn thing. Man. I'd be a wealthy man. They were five dollars each. I was supposed to go with a woman named Jude, the most beautiful woman in the world. She had short hair and braids. You know, back there before you know anything was popular. You know. I think I had a damn red and orange dashiki from my father's barbershop. We'll get to my father before we leave today. Had two tickets and never made Woodstock for Jude and Richie Havens. We met inside a Paisley coffee house, two young hippies under wild blue strobe lights. Never made Woodstock and had two tickets. Almost hitchhiked with a woman named Jude, the most beautiful woman in the world. Had two tickets and never made Woodstock. Jude, most beautiful woman in the world, wanted to minuet at Yasger's farm. Was I stoned on the flames in her brown eye? Never made Woodstock and had two tickets where Haven sang freedom and goddamn psalms played on congas to half the unwashed world. There was mud and love and Jude and love too. She wanted to embrace his love, be charm, and pet down his planetary afro. They say the earth shook the heavens, havens, call, response, his fingers on God's guitar. Had two tickets and never made Woodstock under a blanket, nude, beautiful Jude. I started writing this poem over 40 years ago. I just finished it a few weeks ago. <laughs> Literally, I mean, I started, I, I've always want, wanted to write on Muhammad Ali, but I couldn't for 40 years until he died. The boxer hit us with his pitchfork wit for Muhammad Ali. Were those folded angel wings on his back or devil's fist inside a 19-foot ring? He was no man holding a toy pitchfork. The angels first arrived in chariots and lifted him off the boxing canvas, retrieved his gold medal on his bronze chest. 
The boxing ring was left empty as they lowered the bare, bare bulb and announced 12 rounds of battle royal with pitchfork and chains. His wings unfolded above the burning cities and trenches half filled with napalm. He broke free from Earth's pitch dominion, met the Beatles, MLK, Mr. X, King's essay against the war, how long? He fought rounds with bare knuckle fisticuffs. Ali had no quarrel with the Viet Cong and they never called him a nigger boy. He had no need for the army mess kit, a gentleman boxer with pitchfork wit. I have um, one, two, three more, four poems to go. <laughs> I was at a reading and the poet said, I got one more to do and then I got one more to do. One more to do. I just have four. <laughs> My father, and this is about everybody's father. Trump can learn a bit about the working class here. He worked from nine to five for 40 years as a barber. 11 to seven for 40 years on the night shift making ball bearings. He was a landlord in his 20, in the, for 24 hours a day in his, um, he rented out the second, third attic apartments, all nine of us were on the first floor, et cetera, et cetera. He kept the garden, grapevines. The title poem of uh, my new and selected poems. We did not fear the father we did not fear the father as the barber who stood like a general in a white jacket with a green visor cap. For six long days he held a straight razor like a sword until his porcelain chrome chariot became a down-home chair. The crop-eared son learned to see how a working man's day job after the night shift filled his son's small pockets with licorice filled the offering plate and paid for the keeper who clipped our grapevines under his own pageant. We did not fear the father as landlord in our three-story tenement who took charge of four apartments and the attic dwellers. We searched each corner of the dirt cellar for a fuse box while he broke out plasterboard upstairs with a sledgehammer. We peeled out paper from wire mesh and read the headline news a century old, before he lifted us like birds from our bunk beds. We did not fear the father until he entered the tomb of noise for his night job, shaping molten steel into ball bearings as we stared into the barbed grate where he spent and stood before the furnace sending smoke into the trees. Fear became the eight-hour echo and glow inside his skull, the high-pitched metal scraping our ears as our provider left the factory floor with oil and sawdust in his mouth and punched out as the fermented daylight burned his eyes. We did not fear our father until he stooped in the dark. Three more. The blues guitar. One of my, my last trilogy is mostly, um, I borrowed titles from Robert Johnson, The Father of the Blues. And this is done much earlier, a prose poem. The, the blues guitar. One can learn about the blues living in Tulsa during a killer frost and by picking from the stem of winter collards and the phantom notes of the blues can be taught by listening to the chorus under the bare feet at dawn, under the pine and snow, by the meeting of stone and water and the splitting seed. The windows are breaking in the storm cellar. There is a clock radio with large brown dials on the screen porch. The blanched hooves of the farm animals thunder in their floating stall. One can sing about the blues and digging up mud and potatoes for two world wars and countless half world wars. How does one keep time to music planted with a hole and groomed by a tiller which turns out a tune accompanied by a single inhuman voice and thrives like a congregation walking into the baptismal waters? 
One uneven step into the winter garden and nothing in the soil can be saved. The moaning chords of the blues echo behind each ball and chain and one can hide where one can sleep. I deal with all kinds of forms. I've taught, or get taught prosody, poetics, from everything from Sestina, Villanelle, prose poems, variant triple Sestinas. I wrote Stephen Hawking at Oxford a few years ago about the origins of medieval pattern poetics. This is serious business. Autobiography of nine genres. This is a Petrarchan sonnet for the end of the world. It begins with the death of a prose poem about the Polish, Blacks, and Puerto Ricans at the beggar's wedding to a ballroom dancer in New Britain, Connecticut. There is a vill villanelle sitting beside two fa swollen faces of children asleep in the smoking grease of a barroom kitchen. This is the first epistle written to our next door neighbor, a naked dancing Russian bear who lives alone in his third floor flat and appears at each family barbecue on his porch with his genitals cut off 29 years before by a boy soldier wearing gloves in one final act of the war. There is a Georgia didactic descriptive verse inside the washing machine knocking against the oak tree and it shows how its belly cut off three of Aunt Callie's fingers and a thumb. This is the triple sestina found scattered at the factory gate with my father's hands stirring the white fires, his fountain of beauty rocking inside a metal drum. There's a haiku behind a locked door in the parley at the end of summer. This is becoming a novel prospectus about two fishing villages, one in North Carolina and one in Connecticut, for the, oh, the hell I know. The other in El Salvador, and both have only one street light flashing yellow. There's the envoy in the last line with a man holding up one ear of a dog and the scalp of a peasant. One more, if I get through this ice. I poured it on my head, but I don't want to become Frankenstein and electrocute it, you know? <laughs> Enough of that. Enough of electricity in the world. Oh, yeah, by the way, I just made that up about Connecticut in the phone. I, you know, wherever I go, I add cities. And this is the um, third in the trilogy of the Robert Johnson poem, the prose poems. I finished it in Paris a few summers ago. Um, and these are my uncles. One of them is my father. If you know, if you correctly identify the father, you can get the free book. Isn't that right? <laughs> it, uh, we'll call it the uh, Poetry Apprentice, or whatever the hell he calls those shows. <laughs> Poetry Apprentice. And this uncle in the yeah. uncle he wore a hat trying to be as tall as coffee dress. I have the shoes there, old school. They, put up their fans so you have that crease down the leg. They were all workers and laborers on Saturday night when they weren't working overtime. They boogie. Not much boogie left in the world. This is my last poem. It's a jazz poem. <clears throat> and I've written libretto that was, has, you know, some of my poems have been set to full orchestra and choir. I've read poems accompanied by every, by every musician in the world, you know, violins, pianos. Uh, uh, uh. I lived in New Orleans for three years. I have a character named Darville in my first book of prose poems. And I have a photograph of him. He's uh, about three feet tall. He has strange appendages all over his body. He has a long red tongue, six feet long, that snaps like a whip. <laughs> you think I'm, <laughs> I don't make things up. That's Darville, but just a short glimpse. Be nice to guard Darville. <laughs> They'll tear your eyes out. Okay. So in this poem, everything's falling apart, but I'm almost done. So who cares? <laughs> Darville meets James Brown in Harlem and New Orleans. 
Please, please don't go. Harlem 1962, Apollo Theater, ain't no potato like Blackberry Jam. Darville sits three hours and three rows before showtime. Front stage is elephant ears and alligator eyes. Shit drift to a black cage and a drummer like a waterfall in the Rocky Mountain. Fat back Americana red party on the 24 hour street corner. Rock and roll born in stamp grade A by the bastard blues. And subway hummingbirds feet on race records found. Sunny side up on a brownstone patroller. 78 thrown to a black bottom mama by a big daddy in a nine piece suit. Woven in Harlem Renaissance fire hydrant hot sauce hand out by a social worker in a three-story fanny, 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 fanny market mango pie in the glove compartment of a three-story Cadillac college in every black-ass pot, a green banana in every two-door garage, mass head alley cat wrecking crew in the Grand Central Station, grease on the ankle shoe, shine Pullman Porter on a bagpipe, anchors away on the continent of the five and dime window cleaner and 59th floor juke joint catfish band in New Orleans, try me, 1982. Mississippi Queen floats on a red river, midnight saxophone like a full moon, carousel of bourbon and beer, baroque barbecue, goat ribs, alligator pie, Mardi Gras mambo, Mardi Gras mambo, street car lizard smokes with Cuban cigar, five minutes of showtime, ain't no potato like Blackberry Jam. Yeah. to sign your book once you purchase it. And I wanted to see if I can identify your dad over there, so I'll take a look at that. So that concludes today's reading. Our next reading is August 20th with Jose Gonzalez and Cheryl Savin Savingo? Savingo. Savingo. Uh, Savingo. Thank you. Savingo. Savingo. Okay. Thank you, Leon, very much. I'm so happy that we have use of this beautiful space. Shelly, it was a pleasure meeting you. The article about Shelly is, um, I, I handed it around, so please, oh, my mom has it. It's gonna be a little while. <laughs> she takes a little while. Um, but it was really a pleasure meeting you, and, and good luck in Massachusetts, and we'll all have to go see her on Broadway. <laughs> Louisa, thank you so much. Your poetry was just delicious. It was so wonderful to hear you read. Thank you. And Joyce and Kaylee, thank you so much for reading. I really, really appreciate hearing your wise words. Bill, thank you. It was really fabulous to hear your music. And Charles, thank you so much. Your, your poetry was really phenomenal. I'm very fortunate that we were able to bring everybody together. Thank you so much, everybody. Renny, did you have anything you'd like to say? Sometimes Renny does. Okay, he's very quiet today. Okay, Renny. All right, so see you next month. Did you have anything? Charles, your pops has the white suit on. Congratulations.